recipient of lifetime awards, but more of more distinction, he actually has a lifetime award named after, after him. <coughs> and uh, those of you who are his uh, colleagues, you know that he is a, a model citizen uh, as well. It's, uh, it's a particular uh, pleasure for me to introduce him. We will have questions uh, uh, and comments uh, afterwards and a little reception uh, as well. So will you please join me in uh, welcoming George to the podium. Thank you, John, and thank you all for being here. First thing I want to say is to turn your cell phones on. <laughs> Keep them on uh, if you are of a mind to receive a text or to send a text, feel free to do so. <laughs> if you actually want to make a uh, phone call requiring speaking into the phone, feel free to do that to keep your voice down. <laughs> we, we're uh, in a world of multitasking. I don't see any reason why we can't have this lecture and have us all carry on our ordinary duties. You have organizations that you run or manage. Think of yourself as running or managing those organizations while we speak. You got that now? Okay. Um, as John said, the title of this lecture is Bureaucrats Without Borders, Public Management and the End of Geography. First, a quick word about the end of geography. The argument here will be familiar with many of you, but perhaps not all. The traditions of public administration from when I first began to study it, which is pretty much the beginning of it, uh, assumed jurisdiction. It assumed that we worked for a city, a county, a special district, or a company that contracted with one of those organizations, or we worked for the national government, that uh, public administration was working with and involved with governmental organizations. The end of geography thesis is that there is an increasing disconnect between these organizations and the problems we face. Uh, air pollution, water pollution. Air pollution doesn't pay any attention to the boundaries of this or that jurisdiction, this state or that city. Uh, gangs, another illustration, you, you can go on and on. So the, the thesis is that geography means less and less in terms of the way we think about public administration. And uh, the, the 
question is, if geography means less and less, what means more and more? That's what I'm going to be trying to address. I'm going to ask you to join me in seeing something. Uh, we can call it collaboration. Uh, many people like the word governance. Just for convenience sake, let's call it collaboration. And uh, I'm very fond of something called the Kinesia Square. Now, if you look at the Kinesia Square, you see four circles with notches, like the action figures in a Pac-Man game. Do any of you remember Pac-Man? <laughs> Don't they look like that? The four circles are arranged in such a way as to cause us to think we, quote, see a rectangle. But we actually see that rectangle only in our imagination. Unlike the black circle, a rectangle is not really there that we can imagine we see. Uh, assume those black <coughs> figures to be jurisdiction. Now, I'm not satisfied with a rectangle. Uh, this is somebody else's work. Uh, and as you recall from my first lecture, I argued that all nature is curved. <coughs> that the, the, the natural form of things is spherical or optical uh, and not right angles or straight lines. So I'm going to suggest something called Fredrickson's Circle of Public Management. <laughs> Once again, you see the for jurisdiction, but in that space in the middle, that's what I want us to talk about. That's where I think the action is. Uh, that, if we think of the border, of this organization is roughly right there. When someone representing that organization is out here working with representatives of these organizations, they're beyond their borders. That's where bureaucrats increasingly are, I don't think they are. These jurisdictions, organizations, have all of the classic Bayberian characteristics. Hierarchy, politics and administration, budgets, revenue, in some cases sovereignty, We, we know how to describe it. This is what we study. We've been studying it for essentially a century. Now, what goes on in here? How do we describe that? <coughs> I would argue that there are four things that belong in Fredrickson's circle of public management collaboration, four ways to describe what goes on there. First, there are no boundaries to collaboration. Second, participation in the collaboration is voluntary. Third, collaboration has only the authority and the power lent to it by participants. And finally, Collaboration has only the permanence that participants give it. The circle of public management collaboration is a fluid, <coughs> fluid, cognitive institutional order comprised of alliances, collaborations, networks, associations, administrative conjunctions, epistemic communities, and other mechanisms established to handle and process ideas and information. In the circle are fuzzy sets of orders nested in the folds and spaces between participating jurisdictions, agencies, and organizations. The circle appears at first to be empty. In fact, such circles of management collaboration, particularly the effective ones, are densely packed with the linkages and noises of collaborative arrangements. These days, it is in such circles of collaboration that one finds adventurous bureaucrats, tightrope walkers, working the high wire without a net, modern bureaucrats without work. 
Uh, to illustrate the density of collaboration, I'd like you to turn to page five of the paper. And I'd now like you to uh, get out your cell phone, your, your smartphone. The smartphone assumes uh, smart as a user, which I've always admired. <laughs> I enjoy calling mine a smartphone. <laughs> Now, uh, I want all of you to call the number that is there, 81-888-721-8686. Uh, all of you dial that number now and follow the instruction. If you don't have a cell phone, you can answer these. You want to use mine? John does it.
these collaborative arrangements are never as simple as the circle uh, or easy as our little experiment. Uh, to illustrate the actual complexity of real collaboration, uh, I want to uh, go to a somewhat more elaborate version of collaboration. Uh, this has eight institutions or jurisdictions and it holds a sphere, which I think is a sort of three-dimensional bit of the same logic that, that holds, uh, that is held together by the participating jurisdiction, but the same things hold. Participation is voluntary, there are no borders. You have only the authority lent to you by the, by the participants, etc. See the lines, uh, and that is very simplified. It's actually much, much, much more complex <coughs> to make things work like that. Now, I want to do an illustration of this. My uh, student will recognize this. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, but I hope it'll make the point. Uh, one version of interjurisdictional and interorganizational collaboration is what we call high reliability organizations, or better yet, high reliability systems, distinct from organizations, at least organizations in the jurisdictional sense. Uh, so I want to describe one of those. Uh, how many of you uh, went to Phoenix for the recent ICMA conference? Okay. Say you took Southwest Airlines. That's a private corporation. You can buy stock. I would advise you to buy stock in Southwest Airlines. Say you left from Kansas City International Airport, which is managed by the city of Kansas City, Missouri. It's a local government department. So you got a private corporation, a local government department. The fuel is provided by Exxon, another privately held corporation. Transportation passenger security was provided by the TSA, or the Department of Homeland Security. Fifth, <coughs> aircraft maintenance is, was provided by the Total Quality Airplane Maintenance Corporation. I made that up. But somebody had to do the maintenance. Six, while in flight, your airplane is guided by federally employed air traffic controllers. Seven, rules and policies for commercial air travel are made by the Federal Aviation Administration and the Department of, of the Department of Transportation. Finally, you land at the Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport, which is owned by the City of Phoenix, a Department of the Government of the City of Phoenix. That, that's eight, and imagine what it contains. Is there anybody in charge? Is there an obvious hierarchy? Is it an organization? Certainly not in the traditional way we, we think of. It is a, certainly a kind of organization. Uh, the, the, the word systems was a fashionable word in the 70s and 80s. Uh, some of my senior colleagues will remember it, how important it was in those days. Inputs, outputs, black boxes. This, this circle would have been what we used to call black boxes. Uh, well, they're no longer black. We can see into them. We understand what's going on in there. Uh, the, the point is, I'm convinced that increasingly in the field of public administration, we're going to be studying these spheres because increasingly we're going to be working both four jurisdictions and in these spheres, maybe many spheres of many types. <coughs> the thing that I want to impress you with is how stunningly effective these things are. Think of it this way. Any Friday afternoon in the United States, there are just short of a million people flying through the air at 
about 500 miles an hour. Uh, just under a million people landing. That's a weekend. There hasn't been a commercial air disaster for four years in the U.S. So uh, I'm persuaded that collaboration, at least defined in this way, works very effectively. Uh, now, there are certain things we know about high reliability collaboration, and I'm going to tick a few of those off because they're there are other kinds of collaboration that are low reliability, very low reliability, or, or collaborations that have a very high error term, lots of shit. Anyway, the characteristics that, that are a part of high reliability, and particularly the air travel example I used, very tight coupling between just these, these <coughs> Eight organizations are very tightly coupled. They're in routine contact by the second. Uh, second, uh, they have redundant systems. They have at least two, if not three or four ways to do pretty much everything. Uh, they have high standards of personnel training and lots of it. Think of the training that pilots get. <coughs> I worry a little about them. TSA training there, but anyway. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you've all opened your luggage once you've arrived somewhere to find out somebody has been there and left you a little message. Hello, we've checked your bag. Not to check the way that I would check my bag. Elaborate systems for error detection or at a minimum, not punishing people for suggesting that there may be problems, which is a common characteristic of bureaucratic organizations. Rigid protocols for equipment maintenance. It's interesting to watch the fuss over the Dreamliner, the new Boeing airplane. Um, rigid protocols for maintenance. Now they're trying to patch that problem. Uh, standards for baggage security uh, and a highly disciplined interface between technology and human behavior. Uh, so that's an illustration of collaboration in, the, in a sphere. Now let me use another example or two. Uh, one would be a metropolitan area. Take Greater Kansas City. Uh, there are formal interjurisdictional agreements between the various cities, the county, <coughs> special districts uh, that would fill up this. But I think more important is the very wide range of informal agreements and understanding. For example, the chiefs of police and sheriffs meet fairly regularly. Uh, they have hotlines between them. They make agreements as to hot pursuit and a variety of other issues. The public works directors, which are much more highly reliable, uh, work together often. And uh, because water also doesn't obey boundaries, uh, water goes where water's going to go. And, and so all, the, all of the cities have to connect properly for the work of work. All the roads connect. Uh, well, that's a form of collaborative system. Uh, is there somebody who's in charge of that? Okay. Uh, consider another. Well, incidentally, on research on that, one of the one of the outfits that we found was the most collaborative was libraries, which I just love. The libraries work together with you. And they're, 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 I guess it started many years ago uh, by the libraries loaning each other. So if you were looking for a book and your library didn't have it, your library would get it for you. And they sort of learned to cooperate and collaborate. Now, of course, much of that is electronic. And different, different 
think of a couple of other examples, uh, not to uh, start a different conversation, but just to make a point. Think of the NC2A. That ruined your day, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, the NC2A is all right. Now, I said before that the, 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 the participation is voluntary. It is and it isn't. If you want to get in the business of commercial air travel, you have to play by the rules in that sphere. <coughs> you don't have to play by those rules, but if you don't play, you're not going to be in the sphere. Uh, if you want to have uh, a collegiate basketball program, if you want to have a university, have your university participate with other universities in collegiate basketball, can you do that without the NC2A? It can. There's a thing called the NAIA, which is a small thing. There are other alternatives. But almost all intermediate and large universities are participants in the NC2A. You really can't engage without being a member. So to some extent, the voluntary point is, is made to move. Um, another point, uh, one, one of the things we know about collaboration is that not every institution or jurisdiction holding the sphere of collaboration together is equal to the others. Some are more powerful than others. Uh, you think of uh, the NC2A, <coughs> where is the power in the NC2A? Well, the serious students of Athletic, where's the power? tends to be with the large, big money jurisdictions, universities. So, Texas, Notre Dame, so, um, and if, if a significant number of large institutions doesn't want something to happen in the NC2A, it's not going to happen. So what we tend to say is that what you get in a collaboration like this is the least common denominator of what they can agree on. Uh, and then some institution will break the rules, and uh, there'll need to be an investigation, and their hands will be slapped, and their president will uh, claim they were framed. The routine sort of goes on and on. The, the point is, the NC2A is, is a good example of an organization of, of a system of collaboration that has evolved into an organization. So in the center here is now a bureaucracy. And, and that, that bureaucracy is now used to be Kansas City years ago. Uh, and the first director was Kansas City, still living. Uh, the, uh, the, the logic worked great. And they figured out a way to finance the NC2A, and that's the basketball program. But the power, as we've learned, particularly in the last five, ten years, is with the big football school. What they regularly do is say, we're going to call the shots. We're going to make the rules. And if we can't make the rules, we're out of here. And how would that work? Well, there's a group called the Bowl Championship Team. And it's five large conferences, including the Big 12. And if they chose to leave the NC2A, they could leave all mass and create their own new sphere. 
there would be, I think it's about 80 or 90 universities. They would form all of those little framing that would frame this new sphere, and they would make their rules favorable to their interests, leaving behind the lesser institution. This bureaucracy, I don't know how large it is now. The interesting thing about the NC2A now, particularly in Xinjiang, is um, the director of the NC2A is a former university president, and a person with a doctorate in public administration. His name is Mark Emmert. Once my student. Hardly any effect I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mark is, is very good. And he's he's making a mighty effort to hold this together, which isn't easy. And, and I think doing relatively doing as well as can be done under the circumstances. Think of the Big Twelve Athletic Conference. Essentially the same point. But does the big 12 ever do anything that the University of Texas doesn't approve of. Uh, and Texas is clearly the elephant in the room. Uh, we also, whatever word passes from Austin to us. So, well, the, the message is that to be an effective administrator, one must be established in an institution or jurisdiction, but the, the good administrators are working the boundaries. They're, they're working out in that sphere in some form or another, recognizing that problems don't obey boundaries, and that to deal with problems, you've got to get to the edges, and sometimes beyond the edges of your uh, jurisdiction. Now, we know, uh, quite a bit about such organizations. And I want to turn to some research findings as we wrap up here. Sources and capabilities of participating actors. Actors including institutions or persons. And their willingness to make resources and capabilities available to a collaboration. Collaboration doesn't have its own resources. It has to. have to load them into the collaboration. collaboration differ from simple organization. Organizations almost always involve division of labor, coordination, level of authority, and other forms of power. Collaboration almost always involves deliberation, negotiation, consensus, and support for agreed upon decisions. Collaboration is more processual, uh, hierarchical organizations are more like stable systems. What are the 
characteristics of effective collaboration. Successful collaborations have these characteristics. A, receipt, repeated reciprocal experience, if you will, I will. So we call Oklahoma State, KU does, if I will, you will. Whatever the, they're, they're agreeing. And then we both call the University of Oklahoma, we will, will you. And then they call Iowa State, and so all this constitutes trust. And such arrangements uh, rely on trust. And once you have a trustworthy reputation, uh, then you move to an, another character, and that is recognizing that collaboration takes time. What is the most costly resource in the spheres of collaboration? In collaboration, time and energy are dearer than money. Time and energy given collaboration by participants is time and energy deducted from their home organizations and jurisdictions. So if I'm out there in the sphere of collaboration, uh, giving half of my day, that's half of my day that I'm not giving to my city. <coughs> the effective administration of spheres of collaboration is surprisingly like the effective administration of ordinary decentralized organizations. Once these spheres of collaboration are established, they evolve gently and carefully into being a sphere of collaboration with a small bureaucracy. Uh, and with the Big 12, and, and, and th those bureaucracies uh, bring order, stability, predictability, professionalism. They, they bring to the game all that we admire and stand for in public administration. Uh, and I think these are some of the greatest jobs in the field. You find yourself in such a situation. Now, the, the downside, of course, is that you've got to talk about a, a number of bosses. You, you're the commissioner of the Big 12 Athletic Conference, and you've got 12 bosses at a minimum. Not to mention the governor of those states. And, So their roles and responsibilities and uh, the development of reliable systems of communication, uh, agreed upon objectives and agreed upon means by which to measure outcomes. All of that is standard of administration. So it's interesting that, that to make these things endure, be resilient, and be sustainable, they've got to start taking on the characteristics of classic PA. Although they're still not jurisdictions in the sense of jurisdiction or even corporations. Uh, what are the managerial, managerial characteristics associated with effective collaboration? What kind of people are good? The right people for collaboration are those who possess the policy making right resources. They've got money, knowledge, information, expertise, experience, legal authority, and labor. They, they can bring a lot to the table. Uh, other qualities associated with effective collaboration are team building skills, big picture thinking, strategic thinking, mediating skills, and interpersonal communication skills. It's going to be very uh, interesting to watch Mark Emmer, his man in the NCTU at UHC, see how he survives. I think he's in his third year. seen that uh, these jurisdictions, these things holding the screen together, uh, are, they, they are stable, uh, or they have <coughs> that they are stable. Thank <laughs> you.
seem that, that these institutions are out there in this sphere of collaboration. In fact, it is not these institutions at all. It is people. People are the collaborators. Institutions. You can't anthropomorphize an institution. What you can do is say, I am George, I'm here representing my institution, and I'm in this sphere of collaboration, and let's cut a deal. Operate process or whatever, but in a formal sense, uh, it is bureaucrats who make that system work. Uh, but they are almost always bureaucrats on loan from some uh, or out there on their own on this uh, so-called high wire. Okay, let me wrap up. Uh, this is only tangentially connected to the arguments I've tried to make this afternoon, but I'm convinced that this is what's happening and will increasingly happen. That the way we communicate our little experiment with the conference call, the, the, the ways we communicate are going to come increasingly to define for us the ways we organize. Communication really facilitates decentralization. Central, centralization, geographic decentralization, up until recently has been very hard. Now it's extremely easy. Uh, we've got people living in Lawrence who work for companies in Atlanta, and they could be living anywhere they wanted. That kind of decentralization is quite miraculous and marvelous in a way. Uh, but the, the point is, that, that it is no longer geography that, or boundary that, that define for us what we mean by, by organizational arrangement. Communication is increasingly what, what is defining it, and particularly how we are going to organize in the future. Um, I'm partial to the, uh, to the language of Harlan Cleveland. Said the bureaucrats know how to make a mesh of things. <coughs> mesh, think, think network theory. Uh, it was the jazz musician Miles Davis who said this Good musicians can play the notes that are there, great musicians play the notes that are not there. And we can't see what's in that sphere, but the great musicians are in there. Thank you. Onto that. 
with an appreciation for them having done their job for checking yeah. my keys. Yeah. And also granting them permission to then take it. This is good. And regardless. Would, would they? And 100% of the bottles were taken. <laughs> Nobody in charge of this. Who's to be held responsible when things don't work right? How does, can there be a system of oversight? Uh, if so, how would it work? And the theorists and the, and the researchers' uh, findings suggest that that imposing rules. Think of this as the Big 12, and think of the University of Kansas as the Big 12. We've, all we've got is our reputation. Uh, and is it reputation for fair play? Is it reputation for stealing and selling tickets? What, what is our reputation? Is it a reputation, and particularly systems tend not to worry much about fairness and justice. Uh, uh, and so I don't have a, have a response. Uh, I don't think that I've thought very deeply about it, which is interesting because it's one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> but I haven't connected uh, collaboration and spirit of collaboration with my work on <coughs> social equity. And, and I do, by the way, ask, as an alumni at an institution who said, we will no longer take uh, orders down from Austin, and we will use Hirschman's excellent strategy yeah. and are now part of SEC. So, my along the same institution. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that that was interesting. Uh, how much?
much of that was animus? George, Most of you, those folks in Texas had ever so sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> George, how do you call these elite when you can think of collaborative arrangements among nonprofits that are shoestring operations? Well, oh, I think that's right. But the boss of those shoestring organizations, are, uh, you, you don't, it's not done by the clerk. What about public oh, So when you say elite, you don't mean? I don't mean that. You just mean the rocket operation. No. Oh, okay. You just mean the person in charge. Yeah. They're, oh, okay. Yeah. Other, uh, yeah, Tom. Um, you talk about these voluntary collaborations, but I wanted to get your thought on some of these coercive uh, measures of collaboration. Like a lot of the stimulus grants uh, kind of required or either mm -hmm. um, highly recommended that organizations collaborate with nonprofits, for profit mm -hmm. organizations. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I would describe the organization that manages the stimulus grant system as a collaboration. I think it's in the traditions of vertical American federalism. And the feds are quite accustomed to saying, if you want our money, here are the rules. Uh, and jurisdictions are quite accustomed to taking the money and then breaking the rules, <laughs> which the Fed sort of anticipate. That's a great question. I, I always keep wondering, and I, I don't have any 